morning, All Souls Community Church, and welcome to worship in our living rooms once again. We are delighted to have you worshiping with us. Thanks for getting up. Hope you had your cup of coffee. I hope that you're ready to engage because God's Word is alive, it is living and active, and He's got something to say to each of us. If you are a friend of a friend who's found us for the first time, or you just stumbled upon us, man, we are excited to have you with us because what that tells us is that God is still on the move, and He's got something in particular to say to you this morning. And so I hope you're ready to meet and hear from a living God. To that end, uh, what, what is our custom here at All Souls is to stand for the reading of God's word. So let's stand, and I'm going to invite Eva to read for us this morning. Today's scripture reading is from Joel chapter 2, verse 17 to 18, 20, 25, 28 to 32. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. He said, I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land. I will restore you to, to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Have a seat. As we do, let's pray. Jesus, we are thankful for this word. Uh, We're thankful to be able to open it together freely and even, Lord, from a distance in our various living rooms this morning to trust and believe that, Lord, you're on the move, that you are alive, that you have had and you do have and you will have something to say to us, something that is life-giving, directions, for you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. And so, Lord, what we're asking right now is for your Holy Spirit to come, for you, Lord, to be the one who speaks, to ready our hearts to listen, to open our ears and our minds, that, Lord, whatever might be distracting us would be removed in Jesus' name. And that in its place, you would come, Holy Spirit, and be our teacher, be our comforter, be our provider. Thanks that this morning, Lord, we get to dive into the reality of who you are, Holy Spirit. And I pray especially that we would leave here not with head knowledge, but that we would leave here with relationship. That this time would be well spent cultivating life himself. And so come, come. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Isolation is inhuman or inhumane. This is us right now, isn't it? For so many of us, this is life as we know it. And this picture grabbed me when I was looking for one. The look of despair, the look of sorrow, the look of loneliness in his eyes, I think, Each of us has felt in different moments, and as the past few days have been especially rainy, man, has it been hard. We get a little taste, don't we, of what Noah must have felt like on the ark when he was uh, in quarantine for 40 days, and it was raining every one of them. Um, But isolation is inhumane. We've we've known this since we first started studying the effects of of uh, children in orphanages back in the 80s in Romania, where it says neglect is awful for the brain, says Charles Nelson, a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, without someone who is a reliable source of attention, affection, and stimulation, he says, the wiring of the brain goes awry. We've seen this, we've studied this, this is not new news to us, but even as this coronavirus isolation has started to really take uh, its effect, what we're seeing also is that in the older generation, social isolation has been associated with significantly increased risk of uh, premature mortality from all causes. The report found including a 50% increased risk of developing dementia, a 29% increased risk of incident coronary heart disease, a 25% increased risk for cancer mortality, and a 59% increased risk of functional decline, and a 32% increased risk of stroke. Just to say those things out loud should grab our attention. What on earth is going on? 
isolation has an impact. It is inhuman, but not just in infants, not just in the older generation, but actually in all of us. Loneliness, it says, causes stress, and long-term or chronic stress leads to more frequent elevations of a key stress hormone, cortisol, and is also linked to higher levels of inflammation in the body. This, in turn, damages blood vessels and other tissues, increasing the risk of heart disease, diabetes, joint disease, depression, obesity, and premature death. Wow. (laughs) Is it any wonder why it feels as heavy and as bad as it does sometimes when we're talking about isolation? Because isolation is inhuman. But that reality is simply a window into the real reality that, uh, of the isolation underneath the isolation, of the separation that has caused all of the separation that we are experiencing, not just in coronavirus, but especially and particularly in coronavirus quarantine. And that's our separation from God himself. And as we've been studying through the book of Joel, what we found is there are movements, there are steps, if you will, that God has given us for how to survive life in a plague. And the first one was to lament, to cry out, to to allow ourselves to feel the injustice of what's broken in the world. This isn't right, it's not okay, and God's not okay with it. So to rail, and then to release, to allow God to take us down the river called sadness and have its intended effect on us that we can release the things that are too heavy for us to carry, that are too dangerous for for us to keep down in, that we can release them, rail and release, lament. That was week one. Week two, we talked about repenting, this idea of turning back to God because God is the God of life and all of life, all of the brokenness in this world is the result of us turning away from him. The, the sin virus that we've been talking about, we said was produced in the laboratory of our own rebellion. And so it's in that very same laboratory that God wants us to do the real work to dive in and to dive deeper, to turn back to life in all the ways that we've turned away from him. That was step two. So lament, repent. And today is the third and and final sermon in this series through the book of Joel where we're going to talk about receiving. Receiving. Receiving what? Well, a better question is receiving whom? In verse 18 in the passage that Eva read for us, God says that I will have pity on my people. And he says he's going to do two things. He's going to remove and he's going to restore. He's going to remove the northerner, which is clearly first a reference to the locusts, the locusts who have invaded. But that idea of northerner is clearly putting an illusion in the minds and hearts of God's people that God is in the business. He said, I'm going to remove the Babylonians. For remember, the context here is a context of of exile, a context of conquest. Israel had been defeated by the Babylonian Empire, which was to the north. They had come down like locusts and invaded the land and destroyed the land and taken the exiles away, the the Israelites away into exile. And now they're back and they're trying to rebuild. And God is making a promise here, not simply to remove the locusts, which are what you see in this picture, but that he's going to remove the Babylonians and more, more specifically, the plague inside of the Israelites that actually asked for the Babylonians to come. That virus that God calls sin and rebellion. So God's making a promise to remove that, but he's also making a promise to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And I love this word restore because it literally means he's going to bring back what we lost when we turn back. Remember, repent is turn back. God says, when you turn back, I'm going to bring back what you lost. And so it's not simply a matter of removing the virus. It's also a matter of restoring what was lost. Wrap your mind and your head around that for just a minute. When you think about for them, it was their crops. Like physically, they lost their food. Their, 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 their economy was completely crushed. So is ours. We've lost jobs, we've lost retirement, we've lost lives. And in this passage, God is saying, I'm going to restore everything that you've lost, everything, the years that the locusts have eaten. He's not simply saying the stuff, he's saying everything we've lost, he's going to be in the business of restoring. That includes even on the emotional side when he says, my people Israel will never again be put to shame. He's saying, I'm the one who's not just taking care of on the outside, but what's, I'm also taking care of the things, the emotions on the inside, which for us, we've just talked about loneliness, depression, 
anxiety, all of these things are on the radar and on the heart of our God. And I just want to pause there for a second with you guys. Does that sound like good news to you? We're in, we're in the context of a plague. We're living in quarantine. It's been how many weeks? Oh, that's right, forever. It's been forever. It is unrelenting. And in the middle of that, in the middle of that, our God comes to us with this word. I'm going to have, I'll use a different word, compassion. Remember that from last week? The Lord, the Lord, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The God of compassion and grace. I'm going to have compassion. I'm going to remove the virus and I'm going to restore what the virus took away. There is no better news than that for those caught up in this plague. And friends, that's every last one of us. The question though is how is he going to do it? How is he going to do it? Well, he's going to do it through the very thing that was first broken, the very thing that caused all of this virus to come in in the first place. Remember, when we turn away from the God of life, the only option is death. And so the answer to the virus in here and the virus out there is restored relationship. Verse 27 in our passage, it says, you will know that I am in the midst of her, in the midst of Israel. Do you hear it? Did you hear it? The promise is the promise of Emmanuel, that God says, I'm gonna come and be with my people. It's a promise echoed throughout the prophets, specifically in Isaiah, when he says, you're gonna call this promised Messiah, this, this savior of the universe, Emmanuel, God with us. It's the promise made in Christmas, but it's, it's the promise that is satisfied. It finds its fulfillment in Easter, when Jesus actually threw his own blood on the cross becomes the antidote for that sin. But that's not the end of the story because if it was, we'd be scratching our heads thinking, well, that's nice. Jesus came, he promised to be with his people and he was, he promised to be the antidote and I guess somehow he could be, but how is he still with us if he went back to heaven 2,000 years ago? Well, that's why Pentecost matters. Pentecost, that event in Acts chapter two, when the disciples are all in the upper room praying and, and waiting and praying and waiting and praying and waiting. And all of a sudden, the room starts to shake. And it says, a loud wind came in. And all of a sudden, the spirit fell on them like tongues of fire. And they were filled, filled to the overflow with the Holy Spirit, filled with the person and presence of God, filled with the power of God to go out and preach, filled with the power of God to do miracles, filled with God. And suddenly we get our answer because it was not ever simply a plan for God to put on our skin and walk amongst us. No, the plan was always this, for God to be in our midst. Better than in ancient Israel in the temple. Even better than Adam and Eve in the garden. Because for Adam and Eve, God was still out there. But where does God say in Pentecost, and what does God show us at Pentecost? Where is he taking up residence? In here. In here. He's saying, I'm going to get so close to you that nothing can ever take me away from you. Now, why does it say first fruits up there? You're like, wait, get, get to that word up there. I don't understand. Well, here's why it's first fruits. Because do you realize that we call Pentecost what we associate in the Christian church with Acts chapter 2. But the Jews of that time, they understood Pentecost very differently until Acts chapter 2. Because Pentecost for them was a feast. It was a feast that happened 50, heads penta, 50 days after what event? 50 days after the Passover. 50 days after the Passover at the giving of the law. On, when, when Moses went up on the top of Mount Sinai to receive the law, that was 50 days after Passover, it was celebrated, this event called Pentecost. But for the, the people of Israel, this was a, a two-sided celebration. It was the fact that God gave them the law, so God was caring for their hearts and souls. But it was also the fact that God said, every seven weeks after Passover, 49 days or 50, the 50th day, that Sabbath, I want you to have a festival called the Feast of Weeks. And in Leviticus, it's called the Feast of the First Fruits. Because here's what you're gonna do. That day is gonna be your harvest day. 
That day is going to be the day when you get to see with your eyes and taste with your mouth that the promises that I made to you when you were in slavery to Egypt and I brought you out through these plagues, the promises that I made are yes and amen, to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of provision, a land where God and his people live together. So it was going to be a place of first fruits. Well, I want you to realize that at Pentecost, God does the same thing on steroids. Pentecost, Acts chapter two, Pentecost, when the spirit comes, God cares for his people by teaching them on the inside who he is and by satisfying our souls for for the very thing that was most broken with our world, the very thing that's most broken with our bodies, the very thing that's broken out there and in here has been caused by this separation from God. And at Pentecost, God gives us his spirit. He pours out what he calls the first fruits of his spirit so that we can begin to think differently we can begin to understand differently. We can begin to hope differently. We can begin to live differently by the mind of God, through the power of God, by the presence of God, through the spirit of God. Not just stone tablets that Moses brought down on Mount Sinai and said, read and see if you can understand. But God writing his law on our hearts by taking up residence here and making this the temple of the living God. God coming to be with his people, restored relationships. That's what Joel promised. That's what God promised through the prophet of Joel in chapter two in our text for this morning. And it's this picture that I love as it's painted in the book of Ezekiel, one of the other prophets, talking about this very same promise because he he paints it like this. He says, this is what it's going to look like. He says, it's going to look like Israel, which is up here on Mount Zion, right? The throne room of God himself, where the presence of God was. And from the the throne room of God, there's going to be a stream that trickles out underneath it. And as that stream goes out from there, it's going to get deeper and wider and deeper and wider and deeper and wider. And on both sides of the stream, there are going to be Trees whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. Trees of life, if you will, that bring restoration. It's a picture of the garden on steroids. The garden on both sides of this river of light that gets deeper and wider. It says it trickles all the way down from the temple in Jerusalem and then falls like a waterfall into the Arabah, the Sea of the Arabah, or in other words, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea where nothing grows, Nothing is alive and everything is dead. A picture of the very thing we're most afraid of in the face of this plague. You know what the result is in Ezekiel 47? That water, that water that flows from the throne room of God, that water that pours out from God that is very much a picture of the spirit of God, when that water crashes down into the dead sea, the Dead Sea becomes alive. The Dead Sea is full of fish of every kind. The Dead Sea is no longer dead, but it is alive. It is full of life. And yet it's progressively so, isn't it? From the top where Jerusalem is, the temple, it gets deeper and wider and deeper and wider. It's a picture of how God has promised to bring his kingdom, hence first fruits. That was an agricultural term that the farmers in Israel would have understood for the harvest didn't come just once. It came in cycles. It was the first fruits and then the second harvest and then the third harvest. And we know it best in our region with apples, right? Which apples are harvested first? And then, I don't know what they are. Maybe they're the Macintosh and then maybe it's the Red Delicious and then maybe it's the Granny Smith, but they don't all come at the same time. If you go late in the season, you get certain apples. Early in the season, you get other apples, but it's all one apple harvest. It's one harvest. And what God is saying is, I want you to believe with the first fruits that the rest of the harvest is coming. Because if you've been listening at all, the struggle in your heart right now is to say, wow, yeah, this this sounds really good, but it doesn't feel very good right now. 
I still feel isolated. I still feel alone. I still have these moments. And that's why I love, I love the words of Romans 8.23. When, when God says through the, the, the Apostle Paul that we have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. And so do you know what we do? Our first response in Acts chapter 8, we have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit and therefore we groan. We groan with the Spirit for this world that is broken to be remade. Translation, the very thing you feel in your heart right now is the very thing God said you would feel. When the Spirit, you start to taste and, and experience and be filled with and be poured out on by the Spirit of God himself, you would groan. Why? Because you understand all the more that this is not the way it's supposed to be. And our God's the one who says, this is also not the end of the story. It's why in the, pro, in the book of Joel, it talks about lamenting, hence groaning, and then repenting, and then receiving. Lamenting, repenting, and receiving. Why? Because even though it's just the first fruits, take a look at what these first fruits look like. Look at the waterfall that continues to go deeper and wider and pour out over you. And I would even encourage you right now to just close your eyes and open up your hands and receive this good word. The spirit poured out looks like this, a new heart, a new heart. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will put my spirit within you and I will change out your heart of stone for a heart of flesh so that you'll want to walk in my ways. Your desires will change. You will be clean inside and out. You'll have a new heart. God is the one who says in Romans chapter five that he is pouring out his love into us through the presence of his Holy Spirit in us. God is the one who says in Romans chapter eight that we have not been given a spirit that makes us a slave again to fear, even when everything around us makes it seem like we should be afraid, but that we've been given the spirit of adoption, the spirit where we are once again, become, we've once again become part of his family, adopted into that place. In Joel chapter two, maybe you missed it when Eva read it for us, but it says, I'm gonna pour out my spirit on you and your sons and daughters are going to prophesy and your old men are going to dream dreams and your young men are gonna have visions. What is that all language of? But intimacy, God wants to talk to us. He wants us to hear him in his word. He wants us to see him in his world. He wants to restore that int intimacy now, but it's not just now. He's saying, I want you to understand in Romans 8 that he says, we, we have been given the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. In other words, our future is secure. The first fruits guarantee the final harvest is coming, that we will not simply stay where we're at, but what we have now is the guarantee that there is more to come, that this world is not going to stay broken forever. For as Jesus said when he was ascending into heaven, all of authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that I have taught you. And behold, I am with you always. Do you hear that? The issue that has caused all of the breaking in us, between us, in our world, Jesus has fixed it. He's the answer. He's the antidote. He's the cure. And he is Emmanuel through his Holy Spirit poured out on us, with us, always. In case you missed it, the end of that passage says something like this. In Joel chapter two, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did, did you find yourself wanting more of the picture that, that God paints for us about what it means to live now in the first fruits and to, to hold on to and anticipate the promise of the final harvest? Man, I did. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask. Jesus says, if we ask, we will receive. 
Receive what? Receive him. Receive him. When Jesus was teaching one day, he turned and he, after he just taught his disciples how to pray, he says, if you ask your heavenly father for a fish, he's not going to give you a snake. If you ask him for a piece of bread, he's not going to give you a stone because if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your, will your heavenly father give you all good things, even and especially his Holy Spirit, when you ask him for the Spirit? Jesus says, our father already knows what we need, even before we ask, but he wants us to ask because he wants us to learn to trust and to see that our God hears us when we rail. He's with us when we finally release. He's calling us to repent. Turn back to me. Don't you know who I am? I'm gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And I relent from calamity. I don't want this for you either. But he's also the one who says, when you do, man, I'm going to pour out my love on you. I'm going to pour myself into you because I've already poured myself out for you. There is no better news, friends, for us anytime, but specifically here in the time of this coronavirus, that the pain and the ache that we feel from this isolation and loss it has already been undone. It is already not the end. For our Jesus has finished the work. He has made the deposit of his spirit in our hearts. And the day is coming, friends, when we will reap a harvest of life and only life. Today, Jesus invites us to believe this by asking for it whether for the first time or the 10th time or the 50th time, even today, to ask, Jesus, will you give me your Holy Spirit? Jesus, will you pour your love and your life into me? Jesus, will you do the things that you've promised in your word to do? Will you make me your family? Will you adopt me into your family? Will you make my heart ready to receive your love and to want to follow you? Will you meet me where I'm at, Jesus? And fix what's broken in here. I'm so glad that his answer to that question is always yes. It is always yes. And I pray that he meets you today. He knows what we need. We need to be human again not isolated from him, not isolated from one another. Let's pray. Jesus, I just, I adore you right now. We praise your holy name, Lord, because you have shown us beyond a doubt that you get us, that you know why it feels the way that it feels in quarantine and isolation for so long. You get us. God, but you don't just get us. It's not about simply understanding. You've also come to heal us, to love us, to pour yourself into us as the antidote, as the cure, as the promise. And so Jesus, we pray as you've asked us to, Lord, Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Pour out your Spirit into our lives and into our world. Hasten the day, Lord Jesus, when all sin will be eradicated, when all plagues will be no more, where all tears will be wiped away. Hasten the day, come quickly. But until that day comes, Lord, would you give us inbreakings of your kingdom as you've, you've commanded us to pray for? Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're asking for that. Let your will, let order, not chaos reign. 
Let healing, not disease, reign. Let life, not death, reign. Pour over us like a waterfall, falling, Lord, from the temple, from the the throne room of God himself. Get wider and deeper, Lord. Let us taste and see progressively every day how much better you are than we thought, how much more powerful you are than we thought, how much more you love us than we could have ever imagined. And then, Lord, pour over us with that waterfall. Pour into us with your spirit, Lord that the places in us that are dead, like the Dead Sea, would come alive again, teeming with life, O God, so that from this place of wilderness and death, life reigns. Jesus, we believe that's exactly who you are and what you're doing and why you've come. And we want more of you. For your love is better than life. And therefore, our lips praise you. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us once again that your word is alive, that you are alive, and that you love us. We praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I hope that you were able to prepare for the Lord's Supper in your homes, as it was indicated in our weekly email. And if not, I'm giving you a quick second right now to go and grab some bread and some juice or some wine. You can even pause it, it's okay, and then come back to us. But I want you to take a look at the scripture that's on the screen here. It's from the chapter immediately preceding the words you normally hear me quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it gives the background of what the Lord's Supper is all about. Oneness, being reunited with the God of the universe and there finding ourselves reunited with one another. This meal is the cure. It's always been the cure. The Passover lamb has always been the way. It's always just been bigger than we thought. Praise be to God. For when this Passover lamb came, it wasn't the Romans or the Babylonians or the Egyptians on his mind. We were on his mind. He wanted to get rid of what was broken in us. The virus called sin. And so on the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he gave thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I praise you that we today can proclaim your death and resurrection. And not simply your resurrection, Lord, but your ascension to heaven that we might receive the pouring out of your Holy Spirit as the prophet Joel promised as the believers in Acts lived, and as we ourselves live. For we are the believers in the book of Acts. Until we see you face to face, that story is our story. And we, we proclaim that today, we rejoice in it today, and we ask, O oh God, that the same Holy Spirit that so filled your church then to live through horrific times, and not simply to survive, but to thrive and grow and see the glory of God would be the same spirit that now pours out and fills us. Use these elements, Lord, to unite our hearts to yours, that we might receive the grace of the Holy Spirit. Use these elements, Lord, even virtually as we meet together to unite our hearts to one another. And God, may we believe, may we believe all the more that you being with us, Emmanuel, is all we've ever needed and you're here. And so we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, if you are tuning in and you've never seen this before, this this supper is a family meal. It's a meal of faith. And so if this is not something you understand or believe in, we're, we're not asking you to go grab some stuff so you can go through motions. What we're asking you to do is to wrestle with the Jesus that these elements represent. Because this supper is an invitation for everyone to come. 
to come and receive grace in your time of need. That's who our God is, our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help. He never leaves us, our ever-present help in our time of trouble. But let's take a moment and serve the supper. the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take and eat. My friends, will you stand with me now as we sing the doxology together? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Beloved, as you go into the rest of this day and into the rest of this week, having lamented, having repented, and today having received the pouring out of God himself, receive this good word that the Lord commanded Aaron to give to his people as they too entered the promised land, this transition from wilderness to promise. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. If you're looking for opportunities to find out more information about All Souls Community Church, if you have needs of any kind, if you're looking for community, if you're looking to give, which many of you have done, thank you for that. Here are all your opportunities found in one spot. Go to this link. But we're also trying something new this week. We want to hear from you. What have you, th- what have you been getting? What did you get today? Can we take a moment even now and share? What did God say to you so that we can learn from one another? We would do it on a Sunday after service, right? But we're not together like that. One of the things that social media allows us to do is to actually do a little bit of this back and forth interaction. So check out one of these. Pick anyone you want and just write an answer. And let's spend a little bit of time right now diving deep together. I hope you'll join us.
morning, All Souls kids. Last week we learned that prayer is the first work of God's people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us together today so we can learn something new about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us this week. That makes me so happy. Today we are learning that God gives us things so we can share. Everything we have belongs to God. Psalms 24, 1 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Does that include some of your favorite things? Of course it does. We may get things from the store or from a person or even make it ourselves, but everything we have comes from our Heavenly Father. With Jesus in our hearts, we want to share, not because we're bossed around, but because we're God's children and God loves a cheerful giver. Remember the story John told about the little boy who shared his lunch and handed it over to Jesus? What happened? Wow, when he gave his lunch to Jesus, he not only had enough for himself, but Jesus made it enough for many, many others. How happy he must have felt. This is what happens when we believe everything we have comes from God and that he gave it to us to share. Oh yeah, All right. let's do it. Come on over here. I have cut up a lemon. I want you to take one wedge of the lemon and put it in your mouth. You have to keep right it in your mouth for the count of five seconds. Uh oh, okay, let's go. You ready? Uh huh. Put it on your mark, get set. Go. One, mm. two, mm. three, four, mm. five. Oh, cheese and crackers, that's so sour. Oh. I won, I won. Ah, ah, ah. Oh no, you didn't win. That was only the first part. I didn't win. Nope. Oh my, what, what's left to do? What, what? Well, you've got to do it again. You've got to take the lemon. Oh and put it back in your mouth. Are you game to do that? Uh, I don't know, this was sour. Well, this time I'm gonna do something to it so it'll be a little bit different. All right, fine, fine. Okay. What is that? Uh, I'm not gonna tell you, you're just gonna have to trust me. Oh man. Here we go. Ugh. Oh yeah, <laughs> get it all on there. Holy smokes, where is it? <sighs> we get this bad boy in there. All right, friend, good luck. Five seconds, ready? Let's go. Don't be afraid. Uh. Oh, one, two, mm. three, four, <laughs> five. All right, <laughs> you did it, you won. Oh, come on, buddy, you won. <laughs> Oh, eating that lemon sure was hard for Brennan, but the sugar made it a lot easier. It's not always easy to share what we have, but Jesus can help us. Let's remember Brennan and the little boy who shared his lunch. They both needed help. Jesus can help make sharing feel sweet. Now I want you to meet Sammy, a boy I know who grew up in Burkina Faso, West Africa, one of the world's poorest countries. Watch what Jesus helped Sammy to share and notice how he says it made him feel. Well, well, I might want to say that again. Well, Sammy is, uh, he likes to be the center of attention, um, likes to have fun, and he's a leader, um, and kids tend to follow him. And he's focused, and when he's committed to something, he goes all out, and when something's right, even from the youngest age, he's almost willing to die for it. If anything that God says to do, then it's pretty much going to be good. It's going to be for the right, not for the wrong. Well, I gave all my money that I had 
for Grain of Hope, which is where they go and give out grain to poor people. I just had like this kind of sort of feeling that I never felt before, that, um, that, that really made me feel good about it, that made me want to give it all. He spent time growing up in Burkina Faso, and he saw these people sick, and he saw people that were uh, handicapped, he saw people that were hungry, and he, he saw people that needed help, and he knew that they were real. But also, he understood that God loved them. And if this was God's money, then God would want to help the people that he loved. We have a, the offering at church tomorrow for Grain of Hope. The kids have been saving up, and in our household, uh, we try to teach good stewardship. So we got the banks that have three sections. We give 10% of the money to God into the tithe. Then some of it will go into my savings, and then the rest will go into my spendings. He looked at his mom and says, I, I, I really want to give everything. And Alice said, uh, just a second, um, we got three sections. If you want to give your spending money and your tithe, okay, we're okay with that. But this, this third section is savings and, and you need to save up. My parents were telling me like that I could buy a car or um, go to college and maybe I could even buy a house with that money. He said, Mom, how can I go to college or how can I buy a car when these people are starving? I can walk. About 20 minutes later, Sammy says, uh, hey, Dad, I decided that I wanted to give everything I had um, to Grain of Hope. What are you going to give? Well, the big idea here is that our stuff isn't really our stuff because it's God's stuff. I really feel like God looks down and says, hey, I want to teach you something. I want you to see how big I am. And so I want you to handle this money or this talent to, to glorify me. And sometimes that means you're going to give it away, all of it. And you know what? You do it because you know God can give it back to you and he will, he will take care of you. When God tells me to do something, I, I want to do it no matter what. Even if it's um, giving all my money or giving all I have, that felt really good. Because I knew that I put in some, that I put in my share of that money and I'll be helping a family um, live for six weeks. Kids, you know, the, the real end of the story about Sammy giving everything is that if you ask Sammy, one of the funnest, one of the happiest things he did all last year was giving everything he had. God gave Sammy money, and he shared it with those people who had nothing to eat. God's going to give you something too, All Souls Kids. Pay attention this week and share your french fries, and your cookies, and your hugs, and your help with the people you meet. I can't wait to hear about it. See you next week.